Hello and welcome to the Back Porch and to another session of Back Porch Forestry. I'm Dr. David Merker, Extension Forester with the University of Tennessee. It's, it's raining today. The hurricane's pushed up uh, a little bit of rain and I always enjoy sitting on the back porch today and I hope that you enjoy your session on the back porch as well today. These back porch forestry are informal sessions, educational sessions that touch on the topics of trees and forests and forest management. They are designed for private forest landowners, but others might find it interesting too. And I'm calling these 3030s, roughly 30 slides in about 30 minutes. Um, today's topic is a little bit different. We're, we're addressing the subject of insects, forest insects or pests of trees. And foresters, of course, know the forest. It's entomologists that know the insects. And so they're the real experts here. But uh, I encourage you just to kick back. This is just going to be an overview of about 10 insect pests uh, found within the region. And so I'll, I'll share the presentation and we'll uh, enjoy our time together on the back porch. Tree insects, something old, something new, and maybe before it's over with, something borrowed and, and something blue. It might seem a little bit odd that I would begin with a chemical reaction here, a chemical equation, photosynthesis, but I've addressed this topic of photosynthesis in, in prior uh, back porch forestry sessions, but really it's very critical to today's topic because when we consider photosynthesis, we look at, we look at the reactants, what goes into it, and carbon dioxide in water in the presence of sunlight produces two different products, and that's of course oxygen that we breathe, and then this carbohydrate molecule, C6H12O6. But this molecule really is what fuels the entire earth. We, we rely, our bodies rely on the carbohydrate molecule, and so do insects. And largely that's what they're after when they're um, attacking, uh, attacking our trees. And they, the feed, the feeding occurs in really three different regions. The feeding occurs in the cambium layer, that whole region. And so you can see here, number one, represents the cambium each year. Spring of the year, the cambium will divide through mitosis and produce two different types of cells. It will produce new, new wood, which is xylem toward the inside. It will produce new phloem toward the outside, which is new bark. Um, and this region is full of sugar, particularly number three, that phloem, where sugar is produced in the crown of the tree and, it, and it's dispersed through the, throughout the tree. And a lot of feeding goes on uh, in that region. But also feeding in the upper right picture, you can see occurs in the leaves. That's right where the sugar is produced. And so naturally, sawflies and other types of insects love to feed in that region. And then of course, we know that the fruit is full of carbohydrates. And um, so insects will feed in that as well. But we'll be focusing on the kind of this cambium region and the leaves today. And we begin with the emerald ash borer. This is an exotic invasive pest that was introduced in our region. Um, Oh, probably about seven or eight years ago. Uh, the brief recognizable feature for it is the fact that as an adult, it, it is a very distinct emerald green color, about the size of a dime to, to a nickel. Uh, the, um, the larval stage is distinct too in that it is one of the flathead bores. You can see the flat head in, uh, in, in the larva and it's segmented as well. And then as the adults emerge from the hole, they will bore out these D-shaped exit holes. So here's a, a number of symptoms uh, of this uh, insect and its damage, a thinning crown, trees that are under attack might begin producing these, uh, these shoots. And of course, as it's attacked, it will begin drying out, so the bark will begin to split. And then wood woodpeckers will move in to take advantage of the larval that's uh, beginning to be freed up from this lo loose bark. And so you'll see that on the tree as well as these S-shaped uh, serpentine galleries uh, underneath the bark. And then again, there's that D-shaped exit hole. So that's kind of the symptoms that you can look for. Uh, it's roughly, this, this insect is in the, the eastern half of, of, of Tennessee and eventually it'll probably uh, take over the whole state. The mode of action, the eggs are laid in the bark crevices and the larvae then hatch and immediately bore into the tree feeding on that sugar-rich phloem that we were talking about. And in the process, they will create these S-shaped galleries. Um, the tree death is kind of slow because when it's feeding in the phloem, 
water's still reaching the crown of the tree, but sugar's not reaching the, the roots of the tree. And so it's kind of a gradual death. Typically they'll die in about two to, to maybe five years. Uh, at any rate, these S-shaped galleries sever the phloem, starving the tree, and they overwinter inside and then emerge in May through these D-shaped exit holes. Now, to control the tree, there's the, the, uh, control the insect, there's three different uh, methods of control. One is through the use of systemic insecticides that are applied as a soil drench, and so they're actually poured around the base of the tree. The tree sucks it up. That's what in, uh, systemic means. It, it carries it up through the tree, and then it kills the insects that are inside it. But you can also control it through basal trunk sprays that are applied directly to the, the base of the tree the time that the adults are are flying around, they'll hit it, in, and in this case, they're not, they're not, they're not killed by feeding, and the insect, and the insecticide gets it, but rather just the contact of the insecticide, and then also tree injection, where you can have uh, arborists come out that are licensed to inject insecticide directly into the tree. The crepe myrtle bark scale, the second insect, it's becoming quite a problem uh, throughout much of Tennessee. And the brief recognizable feature are these white, kind of fuzzy looking scales that the adults, adult female will excrete as she lays her eggs. And so it looks almost like a, a white fungus essentially, but it's not, there's an insect underneath those. The females secrete these white threads to cover their bodies while they're laying the eggs, hence the name scale. Uh, she then dies in the nymphs, nymphs hatch, emerging early summer from under this protective covering and they are piercing sucking insects. So they, they're actually sucking fluids directly uh, from the, the thin bark, uh, feeding on that, that sugar, sugar rich sap that's underneath it. So regarding the control, uh, there's a couple different methods. There's soil uh, applied to systemic insecticide. That's probably the most common type because it's easy. People pour it around the base uh, of the crepe myrtle. Uh, but the dormant oil, if you don't wish to go the insecticide route, Dormant oil can be sprayed, applied um, to these nymphs um, over the winter, and essentially what it does, it smothers the insect below it. Gypsy moth, um, a very distinct, brief recognizable feature of, of this particular insect is the very large female moth. She's flightless, but uh, the, width, the width of her wings are about two inches, so that really stands out, and she's kind of this cream colored there she is laying her egg masses uh, on the bark of the tree. Another recognizable feature is that uh, the larval stage will have six pairs of red dots followed by four pairs of blue dots on their back. And, and of course, from a distance here, here's the feeding, what it looks like. It more or less skeletonizes the leaf. And from a distance, that's what it would look like. So it's just barely uh, been found in a few counties in Upper East Tennessee. You can see uh, the, um, the management zones that are currently uh, throughout the eastern half of the United States. This insect's been with us, this moth has been with us a long, long time. And so the slowest spread, I can remember going through forestry school 35 years ago, saying that it would be uh, in this Midwestern and Southeastern region by now and it's, it's not here yet, at least not in, in any kind of numbers. So the egg masses are laid by flightless females. The eggs overwinter, but first, what's interesting is they, they lose their water mass uh, prior to winter to keep from freezing, and then they rehydrate in the spring before hatching. And once they hatch, they hang from a silk thread and they swing back and forth. They're not very mobile insects, and so they rely on the wind to kind of carry them to the next branch into the next leaf as they feed. They primarily feed on foliage of oak, especially white oak, unfortunately, but also on poplar, sweet gum, willow, and apple. Normally it's not problematic. It, it can kill about 20% of the trees, uh, even re with repetitive attacks, but it can kill weakened trees, uh, trees that maybe have uh, been stressed by drought or other form of, of, of uh, insect or stressor. So, the control is, well, really since it's not established in Tennessee, there really is no control that's being done, but outbreaks are primarily controlled by regulatory officials, and so they would airily apply uh, 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 BT sprays. Also, I, uh, as I understand, I read where 
uh, they can impregnate little pieces of graffiti, little pieces of paper with uh, female hormones and it confuses the males. They can't find the females, they can't find them, uh, they can't breed them, of course. And so uh, they found just pieces of paper. Of course, those pieces of paper might end up in the back seat of your car if you've left your window down when they apply these things, drop them from the air. So the dogwood clear wing boar, the brief recognizable for, for it is the fact that its wings are clear. It resembles very much like a bee or a wasp, but when you see the clear wings, that's what distinguishes it. And it's a real problem for dogwood trees. So the adults lay their eggs on bark near injured areas. So if a bark's been uh, perhaps ripped off, maybe some equipment's hit it or something like that, and it's exposed to the bark, the female will lay her eggs near that and then the eggs hatch and feed, feed on the cambium of this injured bark. So they don't really bore into the tree as much as, as feed on exposed cambium area. Uh, then frass will be exposed, uh, will, will result. Frass is kind of like sawdust as they're feeding. That's kind of what it looks like right, right there. Um, and then eventually the bark will slough off, off. So the control is we're going to apply either permethrin or bifenthrin. Insecticides that end in that thrin uh, are good insecticides that are for contact to be sprayed to the lower bark of a tree. But you're gonna have to apply it uh, um, a number of times in late April, in mid-July, excuse me, and in early September to the lower trunk and to the lower main branches. Um, so dogwoods are a problematic tree for, for a number of reasons, but this is another, another reason. The Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is an exotic invasive pest, and the brief recognizable feature for it are these very long uh, antennae that you see, and they're kind of partitioned off. But then also the back, you can see, um, kind of looks like a Holstein cow, black, black and white, and so it's pretty indistinguishable um, when you when you when you see it. Prefers uh, maple species, also poplars and willows and birches. The adult females will chew a depression into the bark, and then that depression is where they lay a singular egg, and then the larva will hatch and bore into the tree, and it feeds on both the phloem and the xylem, tunnel, uh, creating galleries as it tunnels. And there's a giant exit hole. You can see it there in the lower left, and there'll generally be some coarse frass uh, associated with that. And the trees don't recover from, from attacks of this insect. And it is more of an urban pest, not so much a forest pest. The control, well, this is a regulated invasive pest that's not even been found in Tennessee yet. So we are concerned about it. If you find this, uh, you are encouraged to report it to um, the Tennessee Department of Agriculture Culture, and or to your county extension agent. The eradication is with systemic insecticides that are poured around the base of the tree. Uh, and then again, it's carried up through the tree that 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 uh, kills the insect while it's being while it's feeding on it. But you, also, you can cut the tree down and chip it up to control it that way if if it's a, a non non important tree. Flathead borers. I've already given you one example of flathead borer. That's the emerald ash borer. There are many of them. A, a bronze birch borer is an example. There's an apple uh, borer that that affects the apple trees as well, but distinctly has that flat head to it. Um, and so oftentimes they'll have a metallic look to their appearance to their back. Uh, the exit hole will be shaped kind of oval like uh, a football. And of course there's the insect both exposed and while it's boring through the tree, you can see the damage that it can do. The adults are metallic looking beetles that emerge from infested trees. Of course they're gonna chew exit holes. They're attracted to weakened trees. Variety species can be atta attacked and they lay eggs in the bark crevices. The eggs hatch and like so many of these insects, they bore into and then feed on the xylem for a year. They're gonna pupate uh, and then emerge as an adult uh, beetle. Trees will look weakened with scant foliage. And so regarding the control, you can either apply a protective insecticide to the lower trunk in mid spring or use uh, some type of systemic insecticide such as a soil drench. Are very consistent with a, no, a number of these insects as far as the control. 
Wow, ambrosia beetle. Well, we're not going to go through all these different ambrosia beetle. I just wanted to show you this table to show you that there, there's a lot of them and you really have to be a dedicated entomologist to be able to tell the, the difference between them, to be able to differentiate because this is just six examples right here and they all look so similar, slightly different color, maybe different shape to the, to the, to the body parts, uh, the, the length of the hairs on the back and it requires a magnifying glass, perhaps even a, well, a magnifying glass to be able to, to identify this because that's the size of the insect, but yet it's so small, but it can cause so much damage. Here it is on the left as it's boring in, you can see that the frass um, that's being exerted or protruded out through the holes was so boring in, in, the sawdust is coming out, of course, these quickly wash off or blow away and the frass will form at the base of the tree in this photo in the upper right uh, until rain comes along and maybe washes that away too. But it's gonna kill the tree very quickly. Be the beetle tunnels into the xylem and releases fungal spores uh, feeding on the fungus. So they're gonna release the fungal spores. It's not the tree they're feeding on, but they're feeding on the fungus, but it's the fungus that plugs the xylem and kills the tree rapidly. Thinking, think of it as like um, uh, cholesterol in our veins, so to speak. Attacks a variety of tree species, but it tends to attract drought stress trees, particularly young trees that are thin bark. And red maple are highly susceptible. It's one of the reasons why we don't recommend a red maple in most yard settings unless it's on a really good uh, site with a lot of moisture, maybe some protection. Uh, from drought, um, and it will attack just trees that are growing off site. Regarding the control, you're going to apply protective bark sprays of this with your thrins again, permethrin and bifenthrin, to uh, stress trees. You're going to do this in late winter through May when the adults are merging and flying to a new host. And so you have to be very diligent about this. If you've got a, a young uh, red maple, particularly on a drought prone site, you'll wanna be applying this uh, for a couple months here in the spring of the year, at least until the bark thickens. The Eastern Tent Caterpillar, uh, it's a beautiful moth. Um, this oftentimes is confused with the fall webworm. They are different things and I'll share fall webworm with you uh, shortly, but this is what it looks like. These, these larvae will form these tents in the crotches of, of, of the trees. And so it affects almost exclusively the rosaceae family. So that would be your cherries and apples. So we see it a lot in the wild black cherry tree and in uh, crab apples and so forth. They will lay two to 300 eggs in late spring, but they must overwinter in a dormant stage before they hatch out the following spring. And then they immediately uh, climb into the crotch of the branches and build a silk nest. So this would be an egg mass right there uh, that hatches out and will build this, this silk tent and then they travel out of the tent to feed uh, and then return to the safety of the, of, the, of the tent. So the control normally is not necessary other than for aesthetic reasons. Some people just don't like the looks of them, uh, but you can remove the newly forming web nests uh, and the caterpillars either by hand or just by pruning out the section that's, that's being attacked. That's contrasted with the fall web worms. Now this is the one that I get most of the calls over. You can see the female laying her eggs on the underside of a leaf. And this is the, uh, the larva that have been hatched. Um, the moth, uh, it's a moth, but it's known pr principally for the, this larval stage. That's what most people are bothered with. It creates these nests. Again, it's more of an aesthetic problem. It really doesn't harm otherwise healthy trees. Um, here, what you're used to seeing, uh, I've heard it called giant uh, spider webs before. <laughs> you can imagine that. But it tends to attack pecan and hickory, walnut. We see it a lot on persimmon and crab apple as well. So the pupa overwinters in a cocoon hidden in the ground litter in this case. And so the adult moth then will appear in mid June and they deposit the eggs, as I mentioned, on the underside of the leaves. The larvae hatch pretty quickly and immediately spin this silken web uh, that's for their protection, in which they feed. So they'll surround the leaves and then feed on the leaves inside the web. And then they kind of enlarge it as it, as it goes. Uh, the mature larvae then leave the web and pupate 
uh, on or in the soil. Regarding the control, uh, really you can just kind of remove these with a rake, uh, but if you want to use a B BT insecticide, that's uh, generally insecticide that's considered to be more friendly because it, 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 it's, um, while it controls um, this insect, it can also, it's beneficial, it, it allows the, these other beneficial insects to survive and, and live, insects such as spiders and mites and so forth. The Ips engraver beetle. This affects the southern yellow pine very similar um, to the ambrosia beetles that we talked about earlier. Uh, it affects the 10 different species of, of southern pine. It's very tiny. Uh, the adults born to the tree, and the tree's natural defense is to push this beetle out with, get, with its sap flow. And so if you look in the, in the left picture here, um, you'll see these little popcorn looking like balls that form. The beetle bores in, assuming the tree is healthy, then it pushes it back out with its sap flow. But if a tree is not healthy, uh, or perhaps during a drought condition, it doesn't have good sap flow, the beetle can bore in then. And what happens is they create these nuptial chambers and they breed and the females will create a gallery. And along the gallery, she will lay her eggs from which the offspring will then feed. And so you have just a series of galleries that sugar rich galleries that, 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 people, that, that the insects are feeding them flow them. Um, again, as I mentioned, drought years are problematic. Uh, this, tends to be uh, more of an issue with yard trees, uh, loblolly pines and yard trees. We find it in the forest, but it generally doesn't, um, that's the nuptial chamber, doesn't explode like a southern pine beetle would. So the control attack trees um, are those that are under stress. And so really all you can do in a yard setting is just mulching and watering, particularly during drought. And this is important. Bark sprays can be applied to the trunk as the adults, they're not very good flyers, they kind of jump and glide to the next tree so they can't go very far. And if the trunks have been sprayed with a, a permethrin, a bifenthrin product, it'll kill them as they attach it. But that's rarely practical year in and year out, uh, unless you really are vigilant in how you do it. So, well that concludes our session. It's been kind of a, a very general introduction to 10 common pests in Tennessee in our region. We've talked about how to identify them, how they function, and what are some different control options. Really for proper identification and better understanding, you need to contact your county agent who in turn can get in contact with our entomologist and assist you through the process of identification and control if, if it's an issue. So that's what your county extension offices are for. So I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, the rain has stopped. And so uh, time to get on with, with our day and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I appreciate it if you can fill out this survey. I will post it back on the subject line of, of uh, YouTube as well. Um, and so I look forward to our next session and thanks for your participation.